Okay, this week, I promise I am getting this fan sorted out because it's doing my nutting. Um, so apologies if you can't hear me, it's particularly loud today. You probably can. Um, but today is one year, three months since Ground Zero. Um, and I've been very fatigued since then. <laughs> um, and so far, all of my videos have been on different things that I'm trying out um, and how it's affecting me. Um, but this one is confession time because it's taken me many, many years to admit this to myself. And it's only in the past six months of working through it properly. In fact, the past two months of working through it properly where I'm really like, oh yeah, that was me. Now that affected me. <laughs> um, so I have a confession to make. I don't want to rule out the fact that Lyme is affecting my body because recent things with some herbal stuff is making me question um, the NHS again, who again said that I don't have it because something weird's going on, but that's a different video. It's fun. Um, but I like to think that I've got chronic fatigue ME and Lyme because I've not been well since 2015 so it's relevant for everyone and I think I've figured out what caused my ME and my confession is that since I was I've now realized that since I was 16 years old I have suffered from anxiety and why is this a confession? I don't know, like, there's no big deal about it, but I've only just realised! <laughs> I mean, how can you suffer for, like, 14 years with a mental health condition and not realise? Like, <laughs> I thought everyone overthought things. <laughs> I thought everyone had a crippling fear of certain social situations. <laughs> so, yeah. I just want to highlight my particular fears, how they've caused me to have ME, chronic fatigue, and also how I've been able to help myself through that. And so it's partly, to, again, one of the things I've noticed and one of the things that's been really helpful for me is when other people are honest about their mental health, then it just really helps others because I guess one of the reasons why I didn't no for years was because well i've ha got some friends who suffer quite severely from severely from depression and also anxiety but they were always adamant that that theirs was very very that that's what theirs was it was diagnosed by a doctor and i'd never been diagnosed so i was like well i mustn't have it <laughs> um and i've got people in my life who are just like oh you just need to just you know think less so I just thought I was weird, and I am weird, but this is a different kind of weird. So it's I found it really, really helpful to listen to other people talk and know that it's not just me, and also help me to recognise what was going on in the first place. Um, I've had a really, really good friend talk through stuff with me, and it was only through talking to him that I've been like, ah, yeah, that's me too. <laughs> so anyway, so... The things that have been holding me back and have led me to burnout and led me to ME are as follows. Number one, I have a massive fear of rejection, which leads me to be a continuous approval seeker. I'll get on to how this knocked me out next. Number two, I have a massive self-esteem problem in that in any situation I am convinced that I am not good enough. And number three, <laughs> this is my more abstract one, I, f I f for many, many years, feared the apocalypse. Massive, massive anxiety about the apocalypse, which is why I refused to grow up. Because um, there's no point, because we're all going to die soon. There's no point planning a career or a family, because we're all going to be dead. Anyway, right, okay. So those are my things. So how did that lead me to burnout? So, 
in terms of fear of rejection, um, I was always wanting to find somewhere where I felt safe and I could talk. But I was always too afraid to talk and be myself because of the anxiety about not being good enough. And so I was never really able to fully connect with anyone because you can only fully connect with someone when you're authentic. But I was too scared to be authentic because I wasn't good enough. <laughs> so I was always desperate for connection. And so I went, I went from workplace to workplace trying to find connection because um, it was a model that had worked for me at university. We were all at university together. So, and then I managed to make friends through that. So, and we all lived together. So I felt like I had to live with the people in order to be friends with them. And I also had to be doing something similar to them. So I ended up being um, an outdoor ed instructor and lived and worked with the same people. And I did, I built these really close friendships. However, when the season finishes, everyone departs and you barely see them again. And you end up with people all over the world who you barely get to see. And I've realized that's not a community. So, um, yeah, but with my fear of rejection, the reason why that led me to burnout is because I was a continuous pleaser. I couldn't be myself. It led to all sorts of weird behavior. And now I think back, I'm like, oh God. <laughs> and I would wear, it felt like I was wearing different masks. Underneath would be this me, terrified. And I'd be wearing a mask that was like, sort of like, yeah, overconfident, I use swear words when I didn't want to and all this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, and then like, I thought the only way to get connections with boys because, you know, they really listen to you when they want something. And so I'd always find these really beautiful, deep connections with boys. And then, like, oh, wow, I can really talk to you. And finally, I'd found someone I could be authentic with. And then they wanted sex. And then I didn't give them sex. And then they left. <laughs> and then the fear of rejection increased. So that was that. So that didn't necessarily exhaust me. But it was that seeking of community that led me to the workplace that I was at which led me to burn out because of my other fear. So I didn't want to leave this job because that's then where my community was. And if I left, I'd have no community and the fear of rejection was too great. And I didn't think I could find another one. Really loud fan. I'm going to shout now. Okay. But the fear of not being good enough was the thing that really almost killed me. So my last, for instance, I'm just giving an example, but essentially I assume that anything that happens, any negative thing, anything that goes wrong, any person's opinion is my fault. The world revolves around me in a bad way. So if anything goes wrong, I've probably done something wrong and I should correct it. And what this has led to is me overthinking situations over and over and over, trying to predict every possible outcome to a situation so that I can prepare for it. So no matter what happens, I can fix it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now that in, ex in itself is exhausting. And now I don't do that anymore. I'm like, oh my God, poor Lauren. <laughs> And it led to overwhelm very easily. But the job I was in didn't treat me or a lot of the other staff very well. And they will deny this to the core as they have repeatedly, even during my exit interview. But I have a good team of at least 10 people who through their own medical conditions that have since come on since leaving this workplace led to some similar conditions to mine that would back me up. So don't give me that crap. Okay, so treated very badly, like I'm not gonna name the organization, but I have, there are some very, very good people who are now 
ongoingly suffering because of you. And I'm one of them, so dick is all I have to say to you guys. Anyway, so I would... The work hours were very, very long anyway. Um, I wanted to be the best. Well, not even the best. I just wanted to prove my worth. I wanted to be really good at my job. So I would do extra hours on top of the 12 hours we were already doing. It was 12. Having an hour to eat dinner when kids are coming to ask for questions and stuff. That's still working. It was 12 hour days. Okay, so 12 hour days, lots of teaching, constantly thinking. And the whole time I'm like, I need to get this right. I need to prove that I'm not good enough. But I think everyone in my boat was in exactly the same place because we were all trying to be really good and what, and then try to not let it show that actually we were breaking inside because then we wouldn't be really good and we couldn't handle it. So, <laughs> so all of these people are working really hard to try to prove that they are good enough to be there all breaking inside but when we look at each other all we can see is wow they're coping really well there must be something wrong with me or at least i did because i've got the anxiety of i'm not good enough they're all coping i'm not i must be crap and it's not the fact that the whole system was flawed and broken and then yeah and so when people asked more of me than i could give i said yes because I was like, I should be able to. I pushed myself in my social life, even though when I got home from work, from working ridiculous hours, I just wanted to crawl into a ball and die. Like, but I would push myself to go out and do social things and do exercise because people need, people everywhere say they finish work and they go and exercise. I didn't realize they weren't working 12 hour days with a ridiculously physically and mentally and emotionally demanding job. So I've since had a normal job. I could totally exercise after that. But I was like trying to, everyone was like, oh, you should be able to do this. You should be able to do this. All coming from different directions and different places. And because I didn't feel good enough, I was like, oh, oh, okay. And I ignored my body. And I remember it was June, 2015, no, July, 2015. And my body, I'd only been at this place for a month. And my body was like, I can't do this. And I was like, stop being weak. My mother has always says, said, it's not, if you can't, it's something like, you need to keep doing stuff and then you can do more or something like that. I can't remember exactly, she'll probably fill you in. Anyway, that was a very unhelpful belief. <laughs> Sorry, mum, it really was. And yeah, um, and I just, I didn't listen to my body because I thought my body was just a liar that I should be able to keep up with everyone and I didn't realise everyone was breaking too. And it was this conviction that I wasn't good enough and so I had to keep going, I had to keep trying even when I was dying on my feet. And also because I felt not good enough when I did crash and burn quite a few times and took time off work, I was convinced that everyone thought I was weak and everyone hated me and that I had no real friends and the sense of isolation was massive. So that was also putting a lot of pressure on me. I don't know, like, have you ever felt like everyone hates you? Maybe. And it's just like, weighs you down. And, um, yeah. So essentially me constantly trying to meet the needs of everyone else, the fear of them rejecting me because I'm not good enough, led me to do far more than what should be asked of a person. And in April 2017, I had a nervous breakdown. Um, I had burnout. And I got tossed aside. Really. Thank you, job. You're great. All about sustainability. Woohoo, you're good. Anyway. Um, yeah. So. What's helped me? How did I realise that I had anxiety? Well, um, I've been 
joining a red tent circle and that is composed of just lots of women and we all meet once a month um there's a book about it and it's really lovely we sit in a circle it's very open everyone gets a chance to speak but no one must speak when that person is speaking no comments nothing there is silence and that person has space so first of all it makes you feel like a person and that people are really listening to you but also when you've said what needed to be said you feel heard and i I did a course called Call of the Wild, which I've now realised is like life coaching outside. And there was lots of like ECOS group time and um, active listening where people, someone would listen to you and reflect back. And then at the end, um, you like at the end of the course, we sat in a circle and you had to sit on a chair and let everyone tell you what they thought of you. And I've never cried so much in my life. <laughs> when you hear everyone say all these lovely things about you and you're like but how can you think that because I'm not good enough and I'm not likeable and why are you all saying that stop it stop it stop it and then you have to let it sink in because it's there and then we had a little bag of like notes of what everyone thought of you and yeah I keep reading them and be like wow people actually think I'm nice and good and interesting and yeah and and so there's that and then um, conscious camp, uh, another community, and it's just a healing festival. And again, it's just full of people who just want to heal. And so I guess the, one of the things that's helped me to overcome anxiety is to start to heal from it, because then I've realised what I was like before. Um, cope, uh, so different therapies have helped, so sound bowls and then talking about it afterwards, lots of hugging. I like the spiritual festival, there's lots of hugging and also finding my own spirituality because a lot of anxiety can be solved when you sort of go, ah, well, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> it's not my problem, it's yours. To an extent, you know, you do have to take control and worry about your own crap. Uh, and then also having close friends who are really, really supportive as well and finding them and pushing the boat out with who I choose to be friends with because I found some incredible people and I've been so scared. I would have been in the past too scared to be scared uh, friends with them because we were like, oh my God, they're so amazing. Why would they want to be friends with me? I can't even talk to them. I'm not even going to have a conversation with them and that'd be it. And I've since been friends with two really, really wonderful people and they've both had similar things. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> And then, yeah, so also cognitive behavioural therapy. Uh, and I guess the biggest clincher for me has been life coaching. Um, so the, f the tools I've been using, like to come into my queen and set boundaries has made me realise that a lot of my anxieties have been coming from the opinions of other people and they're not mine. And we have to, as part of it, do a brag and like, First of all, brag to ourselves, then brag to a close friend, and then brag to a group of people, and then brag to the world. And it's terrifying! <laughs> but I've been doing it, and my self-esteem has just been like... Mew. Because then, if you do it on social media, people are agreeing with you, and you're like, why? Why? You should be saying, oh my god, don't talk about yourself like that. But they're not, they're agreeing with me and saying, yeah, I'm amazing. And I'm like, oh, I must be them. <laughs> and... Yeah, so basically... Yeah, my life coaching journey has changed my life. And someone once told me that your black dog, because you know the black dog follows you around, it never really goes away. Well, I went away on retreat this week and I believe the black dog is a culmination of all of the things that you can say to yourself and all of the grief um, that you've had in your life and everything that's just been haunting you. But I unpacked my black dog this week and it was made up of a black jaguar, a black cat, a black like sort of like whooshy dark thing and something like Genghis Pokemon thing. And I've realised they're not in me now, they follow me around and they're actually quite comical and I'm just like, ha, ah, you're that thing that represents this. And I can see them all the time. Ah, oh, maybe this is what he's on about. I can see them all the time. 
but they don't actually affect me anymore. I just know they're there, and they occasionally remind me, it's like, oh, you just need to be aware of this, and I'll be like, that's you! <gasps> and then I'm fine. And I've rambled on for 20 minutes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but when I first started these videos, I said it's not all in my head. I still believe it's still not in my head, and I know I've said this on another video, but my head initially led me to get sick. I think something's changed slightly since then, but initially it was my head that led me to get sick. And I'm not saying that's true for everyone with ME, I know people who have become sick through um, toxic exposure. And yeah, but my brain made me sick. There we go. That is my confession. I enjoy it. It is yours. I'm going to go and eat some chocolate mousse now. Yes. <laughs> Goodbye.